Um, the next question I have is, do you think traditionalism is a more insidious and dangerous problem than liberalism is for the church? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily say it's a, a problem uh, or more dangerous problem to the, the church specifically, because um, of course, both are dangerous. But I would say that traditionalism is more dangerous to faithful Catholics. So, you know, people, people want, you know, are constantly railing about the Father James Martins or this or that um, heterodox bishop or this or that abuse or this or that, um, you know, liberal movement or liberal theologian in the church. Uh, but your typical faithful Catholic who wants to be faithful to the church and live according to the teachings of Christ are not going to be drawn in by those people. Usually it's the more lax people who want uh, a justification for maybe a certain lifestyle or they want more of a loose or liberal way of living out their faith. They might be uh, uh, drawn to that. But the, the danger of traditional Catholicism is to faithful Catholics because to all appearances, uh, everything seems to be in order. Everybody seems to be reverent, uh, they seem to be teaching traditional doctrine. Uh, and so it, it just, it looks like a more authentic living of Catholicism. Um, but deep down, it's just as rotten as progressivist or liberal Catholicism, because at, at its root is a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of disobedience, a refusal to be led by those who have been appointed by Christ for our day and age. Uh, to and who have the authentic mission uh, passed down to them of guiding the church uh, through whatever time period uh, you might happen to find yourself in. That is an essential aspect of being Catholic. We are not self-directed. We are directed by the church. Uh, and an example of this, of course, can be found even in the act of faith itself. Uh, we, we do not say, uh, I believe all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches uh, because they're traditional. Right? That, that's, right? That's not in the right. act of faith. We believe all the truths which the, ha the Holy Catholic Church teaches because God has revealed them, because God's authority has been invested into his church, whether we understand them or not, uh, that we, we believe that. And you can find that in the tradition mm -hmm. all throughout uh, this attitude of Catholic uh, submission to the authority of the church. Uh, St. Augustine himself said that I would not believe even the Gospels if the authority of the church did not move me to do so. That oh. is the Catholic perspective when it comes to authority. Um, so, so again, you have this, yeah, you have this idea. Well, um, the other, of course, the other thing is that uh, the traditional Catholic movement has uh, different idols. And, uh, and of course, I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. even want to paint with a broad brush um, for liberal or even progressive those who consider themselves liberal progressivist Catholics, because uh, many of them are actually very authentic Christians who may be, who may be confused, uh, but, and, and many of them have the spirit of really trying to live Catholicism. And you can see that in their acts of, of mercy, you know, helping the poor um, and uh, social, social justice. Um, and, and, and it's funny, so many people will be like, oh, social justice, bad taste, but we as Catholics are actually supposed to be living authentic social justice. And yeah. uh, that's something that is definitely an emphasis in, uh, you know, like the li among liberal and progressive uh, types. And, yeah. uh, and so um, just as you can acknowledge those types also within traditional Catholicism, of course, you have people who they want to worship reverently. Uh, they want to hang on to some of these very beneficial and good uh, cultural practices that are traditional. Uh, and, and so, and these things are good. Um, but, but at the same time, uh, in general, uh, you can still speak in generalities as far as, even though you might have some of these exceptions, the, mm -hmm. the typical, just as in the liberal and progressivist wing, uh, you have heterodoxy and you have people who are resisting the authority of the church and the authority of the Pope, especially in areas such as contraception, women's ordination, uh, the LGBTQ agenda, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so also on the additional side, you have them resisting the authority of the church as far as liturgical reform is, is concerned, uh, mm -hmm. as, as well as the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, uh, or these various um, teachings or directions that the church has cho chosen to take for our time. So both 
are acting in a spirit of rebellion. So even though they happen to be about different things um, mm -hmm. and, and one may look uh, cleaner and more faithful than the other, both of them um, are resisting. And you can see this in the, their common animosity that they have toward the Pope or toward the authorities of Rome, right? So you'd have the progressivist who is upset at the Pope because of his stance on abortion, his con condemnation of abortion, of his hard stance uh, toward the German bishops and the blessing of homosexual unions, um, all those things. And so also you have the animosity of the traditionalist, you know, the radical traditionalist toward the Pope with regards to the restrictions on the 1962 rite of mass uh, at the diocesan level, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, that, that's the dangerous spirit. And the reason it's more dangerous to the faithful Catholic is because it looks more faithful, just like the Pharisees would have been more of a danger to somebody who was trying to be a faithful Jew. Um, they would then be exposed to the rot, <coughs> excuse me, that was within the Pharisees. And, um, one common, actually, it's very interesting because one common, uh, critique that is made by traditionalists is, oh, we're picked on. There's, there's often this victim mentality. We're more um, uh, abused by the hierarchy. We're the ones who are condemned. And they allow those who are more lax and liberal to, 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 to go, you know, to go free. Right. Um, that same critique could have be, been said about Christ. Isn't mm -hmm. it very interesting? He was the most hard on those Jews who were actually the most faithful, who would have been closer to him. Uh, in their right. beliefs than even say the liberal Sadducees. Um, and he was, of course, he was hard on the Sadducees too. And he also called the lax to conversion, um, but he was more easy on those who were sinners, right? Um, yeah. And more hard on those who were who gave this exterior of being faithful, but yeah. who had lost the true spirit um, that is supposed to go into worship, right? They right. also had a kind of idolatry. Um, they had made an idol of their way of life, of the law. Um, and uh, a great, actually a great scene from the, the Chosen series, which I have enjoyed very, very much, um, is there's this interaction between the high, the, uh, uh, one of the chief rabbis, uh, Nicodemus, and another, one, another rabbi. And Nicodemus is starting to question because he's starting to have these um, encounters with Christ and he's wondering, you know, he's had his meeting and he's wondering if it's bigger than, than the Pharisees, than the, the, the perspective that the Pharisees have about the law. And, um, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's offering, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, a little something in my throat. He's offering okay. these, these questions and questions to this other rabbi, uh, Shmuel, I believe. And, um, uh, he says, what, um, what if we're wrong about the law? And Shmuel says, um, the, the law is God. He makes this statement that the law, like he has actually equated the law with being God. They've actually made an idol out of the law itself. Something that is good, they have, instead of taking and, and having it be a means, they've actually mm -hmm. made it an end. And that yeah. is the temptation and the... Um, uh, the downfall, the pitfall that so many traditionalist Catholics are prone to uh, yeah. is a making an idol of the means to worship, making an idol of the traditional Latin mass and putting it in a place in the hierarchy of truths where it does not belong. Uh, as yeah. Catholics, we know that a requirement for our salvation is to be, uh, to be subject to the Roman pontiff. That is a requirement for our salvation. What kind of rite of mass that we have is not a requirement for our salvation. Um, and a yeah. good historical, a good historical um, example of this would be when the Pope uh, suppressed, when Pope uh, St. Pius V suppressed the other liturgical rites that were less than 200 years old around the time of the Council of Trent, would you have resisted his authority in saying, no, this this rite has been, is good. It has been in, in my family for generations and the Pope is abusing his authority and he cannot take this away from his. Would that have been uh, a proper Catholic attitude? And if, and if you don't think so, and if you think that the Catholics should have in fact submitted to the, the authority 
of the Pope, of Pope St. Pius V in this area, and you would be right to do so, um, mm -hmm. then by that same logic, you cannot say that the authority does not have, the, the Pope does not have the authority to, um, to uh, abrogate the 1962 right or that practice uh, and, mm -hmm. and put in its place the uh, reformed right of 1969. That is completely uh, within the prerogatives of the Pope's authority. And even traditionalist apologists such as Michael Davies um, have acknowledged this. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, it's if we stop trusting that the church knows what's best for us, even if we can't understand, you have to acknowledge that there's a lot of things that we don't see and aren't privy to. And the church is there to guide us. It's, it would be like children telling their parents, no, you don't you don't know what's good for me. Like, I shouldn't listen to what you say. Yes. I'm making decisions around here because you're nuts. And it's like, oh, oh man, like if, if your kids did that to you, you'd just be like, well, honey, you just go ahead and see how that works out for you. Because unfortunately I do know more than you do about this and you're going to find out, but it's going to hurt. Like you don't want them yes. to have to go through that. Why are we Catholic yes. if we can't trust the church? I mean, really, you might as well be yes. Protestant. You might as well be whatever you want. That's exactly right. And uh, and for those who object when it comes to like the liturgical, because that's one of the chief um, issues that are taken by traditionalists when it comes to that, um, some of them will say, well, uh, Pope Paul VI and the Concilium were not faithful to the principles laid out um, and they went further than the reforms laid laid out by the fathers at the Second Vatican Council. And that's that is that's utter nonsense to pit the count. And as a matter of fact, it, it's it's the error of conciliarism, which has been condemned by the church, which is this idea that a, a, a council can be above the Pope's authority. The reason why the document Sacrosanctum Concilium has its authority as a ecumenical document from a council is because it was given that authority by Pope Paul VI. And Pope Paul VI used that same authority to go further and to do things that he believed uh, were necessary for the reform of the right uh, or um, uh, that, that he believed uh, were actually faithful to what the council was calling for. He was completely within his exercise to even go beyond the parameters that were set for the council because the pope is above the council so you, you cannot pit the, the you can't pit um the, the 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 ecumenical council against the pope i mean it's just utter nonsense